here. The, the place is intentionally created by nature to hold conferences. Um, so the problem I'm presenting is uh, sequential change point detection in multivariate time series. Um, so here is some multivariate uh, stochastic process, and uh, one or several components may experience a change in distribution at some unknown moment. Uh, we observe the process sequentially. So as soon as the change happens, we would like to detect it as soon as possible. And the important component of my talk is uh, some prior distribution. Um, I'll present, I'll try to motivate with some good examples, where there is indeed uh, very rich, substantial information uh, not related to the data, prior information, that can help de detect the change point and hopefully get us a more sensitive detection procedure. Uh, here is one example uh, coming from epidemics. Uh, please notice different colors. These are different strains of influenza. So the problem is uh, multidimensional. Um, this is the number of positively diagnosed patients. Um, and uh, this is the last season, 2012-13. Uh, this is uh, the current season, the beginning of the season. The question is how early we can uh, detect some unusual trends, some change, and how early we can predict epidemic. Officially, epidemic uh, is defined as the time when um, the mortality due to related illnesses uh, exceeds the epidemic threshold. The thing is that at that moment it's already late to do anything about it. We have epidemics. So um, the idea for a statistician is to detect unusually high infection rates uh, before that and be able to predict the epidemic. Um, that example is uh, electricity prices, uh, obviously a non-homogeneous process because um, under certain conditions, typically in summer, we use more electricity and there is a spike in the instantaneous uh, price of this commodity. Uh, so there are several regimes and speaking about multiple change points, um, uh, one possibility is to use a sequential change detection algorithm. So we'll go sequentially through the data, even though the data is already collected in the past. You can go sequentially through the data set and kind of detect them one at a time. Detect the first change point, then post estimate, uh, the location of the change and start a new detection procedure like use some from that point. Um, so that also amounts to a sequential change detection. And the third example um, is from environmental science. Uh, when you pump gas for a car, it comes from underground storage tanks. And I hope Canadian situation is better, but in the United States, 95% of those underground tanks are leaking. Um, and uh, unwanted stuff gets into water, creates water contamination. Because of that, EPA, that's American uh, Environmental Protection Agency, has very specific guidelines, which is a very specific change point detection problem. We need to detect leaks of certain size, which sounds like awfully heavy leak to me, but this can be detected with a given probability under a given constraint on the rate of false alarms. That's a very well-defined <coughs> sequential detection problem. So, um, and regarding this um, uh, underground storage tanks, uh, this all amounts to solving certain um, change detection problem in uh, regression. Um, here the uh, response variable y is the amount of gas displaced from each uh, underground tank, and x is the amount you pumped from the uh, holes. Um, and uh, the intercept represents the leak. So when there are no leaks, it's a completely closed system, then there will be no intercept. So um, detecting changes in the leak rate is just detecting the changes in those uh, intercepts. Um, but again, it's, uh, the, here it's bivariate, uh, it's a multivariate uh, problem. So my general assumptions are that we observe multidimensional, maybe one dimensional, maybe multidimensional uh, stochastic sequence. And there are 2D families of distribution. So each component switches from one distribution to another, <coughs> if there is a change. Uh, now changes can occur in one or several components simultaneously caused by the same event or at different times. Um, there may be nuisance parameters. So each family can have some nuisance parameters. Um, and there is a prior information, prior distribution of a change point as well as prior distributions on all the nuisance parameters. Um, well, prior distribution, some motivation. Uh, regarding electricity prices, we know the uh, changes 
do not occur uh, for no reason out of the blue. Uh, there is a reason for most of the change points. They occur at random times, but they are dictated by supply and demand uh, equilibrium. You know, when we don't need much electricity, we can use cheap sources, so there will be no spike. Uh, electricity will be cheap, but uh, when it's extreme weather conditions, we use more electricity, so there is a lot of demand, so uh, we need to increase supply, need to use more expensive sources of electricity, like those auxiliary services, uh, small but expensive power plants. Um, influenza depends on various <coughs> conditions, in particular, um, we are vulnerable to uh, unstable weather. Uh, unstable weather increases the chance uh, for infection and for the epidemic to start. So the way I could model it is um, relating the prior distribution to the daily standard deviation of temperatures. When the standard deviation is high, that means uh, the temperature is rapidly changing. That's unstable weather. Um, and speaking about underground storage tanks, uh, obviously uh, the changes are related to the age of the tank. All the tanks uh, are more prone to uh, develop heavy leaks. So, uh, we have a prior distribution, then we should be speaking about base change point detection. Um, there is a theory already, uh, starting with Albert Shriyev. He completely solves the problem for geometric prior distribution. Uh, and in that case, uh, here is the form of the base stopping rule. So, uh, what's base stopping rule? It minimizes the expected loss that includes the delay and the uh, false alarm event. So, detecting a change before it actually happened <coughs> is a false alarm. Uh, well then, this is the form of the stopping rule. We stop the first time when the posterior probability that the change has already occurred at some time exceeds certain threshold. Now, this threshold uh, has to be determined, it has to be related to the loss function, to this coefficient lambda, the balance between mean delay and uh, probability of false alarm. Uh, so how to determine it? It's the uh, point of minimum of the so-called payoff function, which is defined this way, it's the largest expected gain or uh, the smallest loss. Uh, in, other, in other words, it's the um, Risk, negative risk of the Bayes stopping rule. So, um, to find the Bayes rule, we need to know the payoff function. To know the payoff function, we need to know the Bayes rule to see where this supremum is attained. Um, well, he also suggested the computational method for this payoff function, which we'll discuss uh, in a few minutes. Um, Ritov developed another direction of Bayes change point detection, showing that the Q sum just introduced by Herald in the previous talk. Uh, but this is a log likelihood ratio based Q sum. Uh, it's also a Bayes procedure with respect to a very specific, actually least favorable prior distribution that is developing sequentially. Uh, you don't have this entire prior distribution from the very beginning, but this is a sequential problem. So at any moment, you only need to know the uh, current probability of a change happening now or at any time in the past. You don't need to know the future probabilities. Probability of a change occurring at any point in the future. So, um, with respect to this least favorable distribution, that has a Q-sum process here. Uh, you know, least favorable. So when uh, the Q-sum process is far from the threshold, so you are far from detecting a change, the, this prior distribution will give you a change point. Um, when you are close to detecting it, there will be no chance that the real change point will happen. So it works against you. Right. So these are very specific cases, geometric or some very special prior distribution. Uh, in practice, uh, nobody is intentionally working against you. So in practice, there may be a lot of prior information, but it's not one of those uh, cases. Uh, and in practice, there are nuisance parameters. Um, there wouldn't be ID case. Um, no. Time series conference, you want to consider ID. Um, so, um, there is a need for weak assumption. How we can weaken those assumptions? Well, I tried to do some work some time ago um, generalizing both Ritov and Shiriaev results to a homogeneous Markov chain. So, you know, if you have geometric distribution, then of course this instantaneous uh, hazard rate for the change uh, is constant. Um, you don't really need constant, you can. Uh, generalize it to a homogeneous Markov chain. So instantaneous hazard rate is governed by some other process. 
weather conditions, and that has to be a homogeneous Markov chain. Then using the Shurev's theory of optimal stopping, when you represent the expected loss as this expected <coughs> linear combination of certain functions, uh, the stopping rule um, of this form will be by base, uh, where, again, you need to compute this payoff function, S. This is, again, the payoff function. Well, Shurev suggests the way. Payoff function has to solve this equation that has maximization and integration, but it's a fixed point equation. It expresses the payoff function in terms of itself. Um, well, then how do we solve fixed point equations? Uh, by iterations, you define these operators, you run iterations, uh, you're looking for a function, so you can only do it on a lattice. Um, every time you iterate, it increases the computational error. So the bottom line is, yes, this is the formula for the purely base solution, but you can only compute it approximately. Uh, there has to be a numerical procedure that computes it. Um, and uh, the other thing, for instance, with energy prices, there are lots of nuisance parameters. So um, this base rule did not allow nuisance parameters. Um, the way I did it, I estimated them, plugged into the process, and then pretended that those were the actually true parameters, which is naive uh, empirical base way. Um, so, um, this was the result, that's all the uh, financial analysts uh, in uh, the energy company needed. Um, predictive densities for any day of the year. If they know the density, and this uh, heavy tail uh, during the summer months uh, incorporates the probability of spikes. So accounts for possible change points. Uh, well, then, any day of the year, they have the predictive density of electricity prices. They can draw Monte Carlo simulations from it evaluate the options and other financial instruments. But we know um, that the formula gave us the exact base solution, but we could only um, compute it <coughs> approximately. And uh, this was only possible for uh, rather specific and simple cases. Even homogeneous Markov chain is an assumption that's too artificial. Um, so uh, I'm still looking for alternatives. Um, the alternatives that I'll present in a couple of minutes, is just the other side. So here we had the exact base solution, which we could only compute approximately. I will develop an approximately base solution, which I will be able to compute exactly. Um, well, before that, um, just a short other idea. You know how QSUM appeared. Page introduced QSUM as a result of a sequence of uh, sequential, of likelihood ratio tests, basically. And you are testing whether hypothesis uh, whether uh, the change point has not happened, that's the move hypothesis, against the alternative that it happened sometime in the past already. Um, first time when you are rejecting that hypothesis by a likelihood ratio test uh, is the Q sum stopping rule. Uh, well, you have a prior distribution, so you can do all the same with the base test, right? So the base test um, will reject the hypothesis the first time when the a uh, posterior probability of an alternative is high, like more than 1 minus alpha. Indeed, this will result in a reasonable stopping rule. Um, but the thing is, this stopping rule has nothing to do with the risk function. Um, you are testing hypothesis at uh, level alpha. But of course, if you are doing this sequentially uh, after every new data point, then overall, your probability of uh, type 1 error, false alarm, will not be alpha. It will be much bigger. So it's not even a level alpha test, and it has nothing to do with the risk function. So, the solution I'll try to sell to you is uh, asymptotically point-wise optimality. And uh, this is a classical notion uh, in sequential estimation. It comes from Bickel and Yahov in the 60s, and you can also find it in some textbooks. Um, the stopping rule is called asymptotically point-wise optimal if for any other stopping rule you this limiting inequality holds when uh, C, C is the cost of one observation. So, as always in sequential analysis, the risk consists of uh, expected loss and cost. Right? So, when the cost uh, coefficient goes to zero, um, then um, the, this ratio of risks of the base decision rules uh, should be no greater than one. Obviously, if I have a base stopping rule, then the ratio should not exceed one without link soup. Um, so it's 
and approximately, asymptotically, Bayes' rule. Uh, whether it's uh, reasonable depends on the problem, whether you indeed can sacrifice the cost uh, in favor of uh, the loss. Um, that's reasonable in epidemics, for instance. Uh, epidemics people convinced me that they are more concerned about false alarms, creating unnecessary panic uh, in the population. They are more concerned than the delay term. So they would prefer to have this um, law. The beauty of asymptotically pointwise optimal rules is this, this theorem by Bickel and Yakov that gives a completely explicit expression for the APO stopping rule. There are other APO rules, but this is the one that can be computed explicitly. No iterations, no numerical procedures are needed. You only need the um, posterior expected loss. When it's uh, below a certain threshold, you stop, and this is APO. Let's translate this to uh, multi-channel change point detection. So, well, first of all, the cost is completely wrong. Uh, in change point analysis, the cost cannot be linear. You would love to keep collecting data before the change point. There is no reason for you to stop. After the change, uh, you should suffer some penalty that forces you to detect it and stop. So, uh, here is a suggested penalty term. New J's are different change points in different dimensions of the time series. And uh, after one change happens, uh, you suffer some penalty, lambda, every day after the change point. If you miss another change point, then the penalty per day increases. So the penalty increases with every missed change point. Then risk balances uh, this delay term with uh, probability of false alarm, which, you know, the risk is typically expected loss. Um, I couldn't get the proof with uh, um, either Sharia or Ritov's risk, which I expected losses. Uh, the uh, proof works with, for example, this function. It's also an increasing function of the probability of false alarm. So you will be penalized for false alarms. Um, well, the proof worked for it. I'm kind of satisfied with this loss function for the following reason. Uh, you know, uh, considering Q something popular sequential detection procedure. Uh, as the threshold increases to infinity, the mean delay increases linearly with it. The probability of false alarm decays exponentially. So taking a log, I'm kind of putting this on the same scale. So that was not the reason of choosing this risk. It was an afterwards explanation. But at least there is some reason. And then uh, the stopping rule would be called asymptotically pointwise optimal if a similar uh, limiting inequality holds. So, how to get these APO stopping rules? Well, first of all, this can be based on log likelihood ratios, just like QSUM procedure, and if uh, there is no independence, then it will be based on the conditional uh, log likelihood ratios. Um, all I need is the strong law of large numbers for the log likelihood ratios. Well, in ID case, obviously, this converges to the expectation, Kalbuk level information, but of course, strong law of large numbers works in many other situations. So this is quite general. Uh, in applications, all we need to do is to verify this condition. Then, depending on the rate of growth of the uh, posterior loss, uh, posterior expected loss, these are the conditions that are similar to this in bickel yakov theorem, the rate of convergence of the expected posterior loss. So under different um, rates of convergence, there will be two different forms of the asymptotically pointwise optimal stopping rule for change point detection. So uh, first time when this is the posterior survival function. Well, posterior probability that the change survives through time t. So the change has not occurred by the time t. So when this probability is too low, uh, that indicates that the change has happened. So then you should stop. So uh, either this or these rules, depending on the cases a, b, or c in the previous theorem, um, will be asymptotically pointwise optimal. Uh, good. The case of nuisance parameters. Suppose I don't know the distributions exactly. Uh, we know the family, but there are unknown parameters. And each parameter has its own prior distribution. Or they have joint prior distributions. 
then um, the idea is to solve this in a Bayesian way. Um, that was um, one of the reasons to consider general model, um, not assuming any independence, consider general stochastic process. Even if originally the data conditioned on the parameters were independent, when uh, we unconditioned, when we integrate the, those parameters out, um, and consider marginal densities, uh, that, with, with respect to marginal distribution, the observations become dependent. But that still uh, satisfies uh, our conditions. We did not assume independence. Uh, so, essentially, now we will be detecting changes from one marginal distribution to another. Um, and um, it's just a special case. So, again, all we need is the strong law of large numbers for the uh, marginal or parameter free log life iterations. Um, and then these stopping rules uh, will be asymptotically pointwise optimal. So, uh, time series conference. Let's uh, have an example. Assume multivariate time series. I'm trying to be simple. Multivariate autoregressive process. So, autoregressive coefficient is a matrix. Uh, white noise is a vector at any time t. And suppose there is a change in the mean of this process for some for one or several components J. Um, well, and I'm just picking some non-trivial joint distribution of uh, change points. So this should be some uh, joint distribution of discrete random variables. I picked negative multinomial, you know, like multivariate version of negative binomial distribution. And then we need to verify the strong law of large numbers. Fine. Uh, there is convergence. I can find the limit. It's... Uh, an expression, a game between the um, autoregressive coefficient and the um, covariance matrix, um, then um, this will be the uh, asymptotically pointwise optimal stopping rule. Okay, nuisance parameters. Fine, uh, we still have the multivariate autoregressive process. The, we believe that the mean is changing in some dimensions. I don't know what the mean was, and I don't know what the mean became. But I assume there is a prior distribution, some multivariate normal prior distribution on those means with some prior uh, covariance matrix. Um, fine. Um, then, um, again, I need to verify the strong law of large numbers. And it also holds um, some expressions, um, small linear algebra exercise. So this will be an asymptotically pointwise optimal stopping rule. A uh, specific example, here is a uh, multivariate time series. And this co comes from, actually, the data comes from Samsung. Uh, they call it disaggregation of uh, the power consumption. Uh, they basically want to know uh, what appliances you use in your household. Uh, officially, this is done to identify the energy saving opportunities. Uh, but practically, they cannot intrude your household and see what you're using. But they have the output. Uh, they measure the power consumption on different grids. So that's kitchen, laundry room, and uh, heat and air conditioner. And for some reason, the fridge, um, refrigerator is on the same grid. So um, any uh, significant change in uh, one or several dimensions uh, will, mean, will indicate some event. You change your regime or you replaced your appliance. So um, there is a need to detect... Um, those change points. Okay, here is how the procedure looks like. This is the posterior survival function, and this is the threshold. So first time when this posterior survival function drops below the threshold is the uh, stopping rule that we developed. And this will be asymptotically pointwise optimal. Uh, there is strange behavior um, after this detected change point. So uh, I could apply this multiple change point uh, estimation uh, routine. Um, after we detect it, this is either a false alarm, right? Or if it's not a false alarm, then it overestimates the change point, right? Underestimation is the false alarm, detecting before the change. So we can go back and estimate the change point and then um, applying the same procedure again for the post-change change data, um, we'll see the other change point. So indeed, in the case, uh, two change points in the third component of that uh, time series. So some literature. I have most of it on this website. Uh, thank you.
organizers, uh, sponsors, collaborators. Thank you, everybody. Yes, what differs it from binary segmentation is that I'm not considering the whole data set and not splitting it into two parts. Um, as Robert indicated, if the, if the process goes say, up and down and then up and down again, then uh, splitting it um, may not give you two significantly different parts when there are more than one change point. So, the difference is that I go through the data set sequentially, only trying to consider one change point at a time. Um, so, oh, no, I, I, I yeah. binary segmentation could be used to. In your example, you detected the change at time 714. When was the actual change? Or how long it takes to detect? Um, we don't know the actual change, right? Um, presumably, nothing happened. It was stationary time series until that time. Um, or until 709. So um, there was a delay of like five observations before change point was detected. It was a, Significant change point, so large magnitude of the change. Um, where the actual change was and whether there was a change, uh, we don't know. The data is random, right? So it's uh, not a generated it's real data. So, so I don't know the actual change. Make sure I understand. Uh, you are able to get the red curve, right? You measure the red, you get the information as time Yes, grows. but Chiris survival function is computed from the data. Right, but at a time t, at each time t, you are able to compute it, right? Yes. And then you are also able to compute your blue curve at each time t. Uh, yes, the blue curve is not random. It's no. the, the non-random threshold. Right, but if you are at a certain time, what, what do you know? What can you compute at any time? The red curve, the red point, and the blue point? I know the whole blue curve from the very beginning. There is nothing wrapped up there. It's an expression. Um, the red curve develops uh, with every new observation. Um, the, at any time, it's the posterior probability. Given the data observed up to that point, it's the posterior probability that the change has already blue, happened yeah, at some moment. Yeah, the blue curve is really based on your assumptions. It's based on the assumption, based on the loss function, based on the penalties for delay. But, you know, it's, in all reasonable problems, you're going to have certain parameters to adjust. I mean, in other words, you can't have an absolute blue curve that you can compute without any data, for example. It's a threshold, so it's not uh, data dependent. QSUM has a constant threshold. Chosen based on the Desired probability of false alarm, or desired mean time until false alarm. Last short question from Vada. Yes, I'm, not I'm, not, I'm not getting out of the way. Suppose you have two changes, which essentially happen for two series, but about the same time. I mean, what does that do with the procedure? I mean, is it detected as one change, and then are you detecting the first one, and then immediately after it's easy to detect the second one? You see what I'm asking? Well, yes. Um, actually, this is a survival function of the earliest change point. So essentially, I'm targeting to detect even the first, the earliest change point. Um, the, um, this will be escalated as I miss more and more change points because my penalty will increase. So when we have two changes in two dimensions close, then um, almost immediately I'll be suffering heavier penalty. Right? So, for instance, if the joint prior distribution of change points is such that it uh, forces several change points to occur in a close neighborhood, um, that will affect the procedure. So I will know that uh, with even 
the first change point, soon I will have a heavy penalty. So that affects procedure. And try distribution is built in in the posterior, in the red curve, posterior survival function. Okay, let's thank both speakers.